Warning, this is not a podcast for those who have got it together. We are men seeking answers to the questions that have plagued our mind. Can we be undefeated? All right, thank you guys for tuning into our podcast. It's Positively Undefeated. I'm Burl Stricker. I'm here with Jeremy Gray. Jeremy, glad to have you, brother. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for the uh, invite. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I've heard a lot about you and, uh, you know, all good things. And, you know, I know you have a great story, so I appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. Uh, a couple of announcements before we start. I just want to remind everybody, if you haven't checked out our website, Even One Less, uh, that's a great resource, and we're kind of building. It's a work in progress. So, But it's a great way to connect with us, whether it be through email or other social media platforms. Also, I uh, want to remind you guys of a, our event. It's a uh, mixer slash introduction event on September 16th, which is coming down the road. Jeremy, I want to make sure I invite you. Okay. Got gotcha. you officially invited but really we're going to have music we're going to have uh food we've got a food truck coming it's downtown maine which 105 south maine which is at the united country exploration and realty office downtown elk city which is in western oklahoma if you guys aren't familiar with that but if you guys are around we'd love to have you we're gonna have some great stories we're, <clears throat> we're gonna do a fun auction um we're going to um some of the items on there are pretty neat that we're going to be, you know, trying to auction off. So, again, just in the name of fun. So, it's a great event. It's at 6 o'clock on September 16th. You can go to our website for more information. Jeremy, how long have you lived in western Oklahoma? Uh, my whole entire life. Yeah. Uh, I was born out here. And uh, I think I went – I, I moved to Texas for a couple of years. Um, but I've always been from out here. Yeah. I tell you what, it's like, so I've like, I've lived in Western Oklahoma like 16 years. So yeah. I'm not originally from here, but then I, before that I was from West Texas. So, you know, you, you call both the South Plains and people aren't familiar with this area, but if you're not, then, you know, but wind is a big part of it. Yeah. You know, there it's flat, not a lot of trees. It's funny if you go North of I 40 though, you start to see a lot more of like the hills and valleys yeah. and, you know, uh, I love riding horses and there's, I mean, there's some great places to, to be outdoors. And, uh, I personally love Western Oklahoma, man. I just feel like that for me, it's like what I'll always call home. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's, it's funny. It took me a while to get used to the, you know, to like the wind. I've always been around the wind because living in this area, but I used to say, that I hated the wind. Like I was, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But I don't know. I kind of changed my mentality now. I'm like, man, I kind of like it. I kind of yeah. like, I, I don't know. You have to, if you've ever had, I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you like stood up on a high point and it's just the wind's blowing like crazy. Yeah. And you're like, this is kind of cool. Yeah. You know, when they talk about the Bible, talk about the spirit of God moving you. I'm like, okay, this is what it means right here. <laughs> yes. Have you ever had that moment in Western Oklahoma? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a, a spot over by, um, Foss Lake that's yeah. got the three crosses. You may have been, been down oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, we went up there and shot a video one day and we got up there and, and that's the exact situation you're talking about yeah. up there and the breeze. And of course you're up there with the crosses and yeah. it's just, it's just a good feeling. Is it safe to say like, you know, what's the term? Were you, were you a found, are you a founder of Rob's Ranch? I'm not a founder of Rob's Ranch. I'm a founder of Path to Miracles. Uh, I went through Rob's Ranch. Is in, that in Purcell? Is that the difference? Yes. Okay. So Rob's Ranch is in Purcell and then Path to Miracles is in Sayre. Yes. Rob's Ranch and Path okay. to Miracles, uh, I didn't partner that. for the one in Sayre. It's actually called Rob's Path to Miracles Ranch. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you're a part of founding this one here. And, yes, sir. And then you guys are in, it's funny because I, I, you probably don't know this about me, but I was in the nursing home business for 24 years. And so whenever I looked into your, that building, like this is old nursing home, yeah. but I like it because I think you guys have done a great job. I have gone over there um, several times for uh, like on Sundays because I think our group here will go over there and I filled in or just went to be a part of it. Um, and I've known several guys out there either through, you know, just whatever. And I, what the thing I'm impressed with is that, man, these guys are so like friendly and just 
like very open. And I've, I'm kind of, I was kind of surprised, but I've actually never been to rehab or anything like that. Okay. I never have. I've been to a treatment crisis center, mm -hmm. but I've never been to something like that. And I think we have like, just like everything else, when you're talking about drinking and drugs and mental health, and I think we have this preconceived notion about what it's going to be like, like yeah. what the people there are like. Yeah. And, and it's just not what you think at all. And sometimes I think that it, it, like people need to really, be exposed to that, if it makes sense, because it's oh, yeah. different than you think. They're just, you know, definitely a lot like us, you know. Yeah. It, you know, it's so easy to relate to those guys. And I think that people who are not in that environment, have never been around in that environment, don't maybe find them, you know, think they're not relatable, but yeah. they're very relatable. Oh, yeah. And, and it's funny that you bring that up, because we just got through with our ninth annual golf tournament. And... Yeah. There's 150 guys there. And, you know, it, before we start, I usually kind of just thank everybody for coming. And, yeah. and God was just telling me, Hey, you need to get some of these guys that, that we've been able to help up here with you. So I just said, Hey, you know, if you, if Path of Miracles has helped you, you know, in the last 10 years, yeah. just come up here and be with me. And, you know, a couple of guys that work with me, they said, man, that's, this is half the crowd. I mean, there was a mm -hmm. bunch of us. And that's one thing I wanted everybody to know that wasn't, you know, is not a drug addict or an alcoholic. Hey, we, these guys look just like you. They look, yeah. you know, we all look alike. I mean, you, you wouldn't know us in the street. Um, it's just, we, we got ourselves caught in a bad situation and, and, uh, you know, we just, want everybody to know that you know it can happen to anybody and we're there to help yeah. uh if if you do fall into that situation or have somebody that you love fall into that situation i mean i to me it seems like um that there's guys from all over the place who are who are uh, coming here um yeah. to attend um do you guys you know is there a certain demographics or really or they can come from anywhere just come from anywhere and and you know we do we do some marketing on the uh sports animal but a lot of what we do is word of mouth i yeah. mean we have we've had guys come from new york we've had them i mean from every different direction fly in from california uh, i mean you know we've had professional athletes uh professional mm -hmm music artists i mean it's just it's really just god moving through guys who leave because in in what we do you know as, as you know the rate of success is very minimum mm -hmm. i mean as far as getting sober and staying sober mm -hmm. and so the 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 way that guys are, are healing from this and and getting closer to god and, and going back to their communities and and helping others which you know i mean what we do we that's what we, we have to do. We have to get out yeah. there and help others uh, who struggle with it. And it's just kind of like it's multiplying. And, and word of mouth has been mm -hmm. the biggest, you know, our biggest go-getter as far as getting guys in. Yeah. You know, I know you've heard the story and you brought it up, and I've heard it a lot. It's like where you hear about these guys who just go to rehab after and one time after another. It's just like 10 times or how many ever times they go. And it just doesn't ever seem to take hold, which kind of gives like same thing. It's like this bad thought about rehab and getting help. And, you know, I think that when I, when I was thinking about getting help, there was two things that I felt like now looking back were a roadblock. One, it's like I had heard these stories. It was like not knowing anything about it. Yeah. But I'm like, man, it just seems like the success rate is not very good. And then I think also – like I was so worried about like work and like, how am I going to pay my bills and how am I meaning that? Cause I'll be gone, you know? So you think about time a lot. It's like, how long am I going to be gone? And how long is this program going to take? And you worry about what's going on here. When I got over that, when I got over worrying about those things, mm -hmm. it's like, and, and I mean, now I'm like, well, look what was going on in your life whenever you're at home and, and drinking and doing all these mm -hmm. things. It's like, your li your life is not headed the way you want, so you got to do something. Yeah. So does that make sense? So, oh yeah. Well, in your in your mind, what what what's maybe what would you tell somebody who's struggling with that? That's like, man, you know, I've got stuff at home going on. I've got this going on, you know, and I don't feel like I have time or the money or you know, it can go on and on with excuses. Well, that's the ultimate surrender, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you're eventually going to lose it, anyways. Yeah. Your addiction, at least I did. My addiction took my job. It took my vehicles, took my home, uh, took my family for a little while. It, it, there's no perfect time to get help. But mm -hmm. if we don't, your chances of losing it all 
is is pretty high anyway. Yeah. So and and in my mind, the ultimate surrender is that's the first uh, first decision you have to make if you're going to trust God or not. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give this stuff to God. I'm going to take this time and I'm going to do something that's going to benefit me. It's going to help me heal. And I'm just going to trust that whatever's still going to be out there for me is what God wants for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I talk to guys all the time, you know, about that because we have the 90 day is in Purcell. Ours is 30. It's a little easier for guys to say, OK, well, I can commit to the 30. Yeah, well. You know, and, and that's kind of why we did it for the guys who couldn't take off from work for a full 90 days or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just that's where the initial, you know, first step is, is, you know, OK, I'm going to trust God. I do have an, I do have a problem and mm-hmm. my life's unmanageable and I'm going to trust. So, I'm going to trust in the Lord mm-hmm. that whatever's supposed to be here for me is going to be here for me and, and, and pray that whatever's not is going to be cleared out of the way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is you're coming home to a, to no home or you're three months late on rent. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, you still got your life as opposed yeah. to, you know, in those three months that you're putting it off, you, you could be dead or in prison or, you mm-hmm. know, you could have lost it all. Yeah. I think, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to, it seems like to me that you have not only we're talking about different areas of the country that people may come, but also it seems like different situations that are all across the gamut. Like you have guys that may be facing prison time, or you may have guys that have not facing prison time. Um, what's the normal demographic of people that you look like that come to uh, Rob's Ranch? And what's your thought on that? I'd say it's about 50, 50, uh, 50%. I'd say, uh, a wife and, and kids are, you know, they're, it's, we're going to, you're going to lose us. If you don't do this, we can't do this any longer. Go get help. And then the other half is, okay, I've gotten trouble for the first time or, and, and they're telling me that I need to go get help, uh, to appease the courts. Um, but either way, I, and neither one of them really matters to me. And mm-hmm. I tell them it doesn't matter how you get here, just get here. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, so it's, it's pretty much right down the middle. And a lot of guys, they'll, you know, almost every one of them will say, you know, I came in here on my own. Yeah. And that's really wrong. No, the, the drugs yeah. and the alcohol forced you into this. Yeah. You didn't come on your own, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I'm one of those guys, like you mentioned earlier, I had to go to nine treatment centers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, eight times. I didn't learn my lesson. I didn't pay attention. I didn't surrender. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, and that's that's the biggest thing. You know, if, if a guy is like, okay, you know, my wife's going to leave or or I'm going to lose my family, uh, but I've done this. This is to be my fourth rehab, Yeah, you know. Well, you just got to do the complete opposite of what you did the last time. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the things that really stuck with me uh, because I, I kept tripping over the same thing over yeah. and over. The, the enemy would throw out this and, and I may make it for a month, but eventually I'd trip over it because I wasn't doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just having these guys just say, you know what, what, what's, what's one more try? Give it, give it one more try, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, but like I said, it's, it's about 50, 50. Some of them are fading heat from the law mm-hmm. and some of them fading heat at home. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, how I always, I tell this is like how I came to the deal is like, I humiliated myself <laughs> and, you know, and we were, I, we talked recently about humiliation is a form of humility, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's the worst kind. But, oh, yeah. you know, I think that part of that humiliation, it'll drive you to go to a place like Rob Ranch or it'll, it, it will drive you to get, seek help. But if you don't cross over to where it becomes more humility, mm-hmm. then I see that that becomes a problem that, that you actually will not get better or really, you know, I guess grasp it. Yeah. You really hold on to it. Like in my case, I went, I was at this humiliation point where I made a fool of myself. And then I, but I did transition over to where, hey, I really wanted the help. And I like, it changed from that humiliation to humility, yeah. you know? And, and, and I didn't know that at the time. I'm just saying, looking back, I'm like, okay, you know, cause I struggled with that humiliation part for a while, you know, for several months, just struggled with it. And then, you know, really, I think for me, like understanding the grace of God that like, man, you know, my story could be, you know, sh- just people, not me saying anything, but th- looking at me and saying, man, God's done a- some work in his life, you know, oh, yeah. and I, and that helped me 
to like make sense of the humiliation and I, and really kind of change my mind about not worrying so much about what other people thought or where I was, you know, yeah. what I'd done and where I was going and, you know, all those things, because I'm like, well, maybe God, really my friend helped me see that because I was going to an event and I'm like, some of the people that I humiliated myself in front of were yeah. going to be at that event. This is after I quit drinking and, and, and I was just stressing over it. I was like, Oh God, you know, I got to go to this thing. And he's like, man, let them see the grace of God through you yeah. and how God works in your life. And, and that really helped me turn, you know, it, it wasn't easy, you yeah. know, that first few, I, you know, events or, you know, I went to church and saw a guy <laughs> that beat down the door whenever I was the night I humiliated myself and I saw him and I, the, that night, I wanted to hit it, punch him in the face, you know, and then I see him at church like a few weeks later and I'm like, oh, you know, but I think that was the same thing. I just felt like God's grace was working in my life. And I was like, man, you know, and I somewhere in there, it turned from that humiliation to the humble, you know, oh, yeah. humility. It just really. And I, I mean, you can find humility other ways, Wait, for sure can find humility the other way, other ways. But I think a lot of us find that humility through humiliation for know? sure you know where we've just made a mess of things mm-hmm. you know so and and we get that gift of exposure whenever mm-hmm. we humiliate ourselves and we have no choice but to <clears throat> be honest yeah okay about about what okay yeah okay i do have a problem i just showed it in front of everybody mm-hmm. and like my humiliation was having to go to a padded room for seven days mm-hmm. i got committed to a psych ward yeah. and it's like i'm sitting there watching the super bowl and Tom Brady's playing against Seattle Seahawks. And I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, you know, all these people know that I'm in here and, mm-hmm. and all my friends and the, and the gig is up. And, and, but what that did was it's like, you know what? Now is the opportunity. Now is the time mm-hmm. because I, I've been exposed. Now I can actually admit mm-hmm. what's going on. Now I don't have to hide from it anymore. I can yeah. actually say, you know what, guys? I don't have it all together. And I know I've been putting on this face for this long time, but I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic mm-hmm. and I've got to have help. So, what you're talking about that humiliation was the greatest gift I ever received. Mm-hmm. And at the moment it seemed like the worst thing that ever happened to me, yeah, but yeah. being exposed helped me to, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to find some humble humbleness in me. And now it's time to just get real honest. Yeah. I, I you bring up something. It's like, I think at, the, at that point in your life, you really isolate yourself because you don't, you know, you don't want to really expose you. It's like you want help and you want to stop, you want to change, but then you don't want people to know about it. And so you end up, I, I don't know about you, but I end up isolating myself a lot. Like I was spending tons of time, you oh, know, yeah. in, 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 in my addiction by myself. You know, I used to just sit and drink on my front porch, you know, every single night, I'd pass out on there and be eaten alive by bugs and whatever <laughs> else, you know, wake up at four or five in the morning and like, oh, you know, and, but I, I, I didn't know, even, like, even though my friends and family had, yes, there have been moments where, like, they see it, but I also hid it, you know, fairly well. But then I didn't hide it as well as I thought later. I started to realize that. Because I, I, you know, in an example, I didn't think that it affected my kids any. Yeah. But then I realized, because I didn't really drink in front of them that, that much, and I, you know, I, because I would normally do it on my own. But then I realized after quitting drinking that I'm like, man, they knew and they were exposed to it a lot more. And I have definitely, you know, made some mistakes that I, you know, putting selfish, I was being selfish, you know, so many times I was selfish and doing things like instead of spending time with my kid, I made drink or, you know, hang, uh, I didn't put them first, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So I realized that later. It's yeah. like, oh, you know, and uh, well, you you kind of got into a little bit, man. I know you've told your story quite a bit out there, but I, I, I have never heard your story. And I was just like maybe a little background of kind of, you know, what caused you to to seek help and really, you know, the whole kind of the story about you and, and what led you to where you are today. Yeah. So <clears throat> like we discussed, I grew up out here. Um, sports was my entire life. Um, and really, uh, we moved from Clinton to Elk City when I was 11 years old. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I had all my best buddies over there. And, uh, it just, it kind of broke my heart. 
uh, yeah. that we moved 20 miles yeah. down the road to a, a rival town. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I think it was then that I started wearing a mask, you know, mm-hmm. showing up to a new school. And really the only thing I had going for me uh, was athletics. And mm-hmm. really that's the only time I ever really felt comfortable whenever I was on a ball field or a ball court. And, yeah. and uh, you know, everywhere else it seemed like I was just uh, a chameleon uh, mm-hmm. putting on a mask and being this person there and that person just because – I just I didn't know who I was, and and I later realized that you know I had some hurt in me at a mm-hmm. young age from the move. But uh, you know, I had a pretty good high school. Uh, you know, just I mean, I, I partied a lot, mm-hmm. um, and I felt comfortable when I was partying. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, once I graduated high school and and had a couple opportunities to go play basketball, golf, and and football, and when my drinking and and uh, kind of shifted over to my meth use, mm-hmm. um, my whole attitude changed. I became a jerk. I was, I mean, I was a jerk before, but even yeah. bigger jerk. Um, and, and I just started losing people around me, um, mm-hmm. that, that I had grown up caring about and, and my best friends, they were all gone. And, you know, one night I remember I just look around and I've burned every bridge and, and I've quit and I've quit all the sports and I'm all alone mm-hmm. and, I have absolutely no idea who I am, mm. and I don't know who I am without a basketball in my hand. I don't know who I am without this certain, you know, person I've grown up with uh, mm. by my side, and and it's just, you know, I I, I started searching for different crowds and Mm -hmm. and and i stumbled across a crowd that was obviously hurting as much as i was yeah and we hit the bars every night and and uh smoked meth and and you know all the good stuff and we just it was just one big party and before i knew it you know i'd crossed an imaginary line that i didn't know i was crossing Mm -hmm. where i become dependent uh on the substances Mm -hmm. and I, i remember when i was i think i was 20 years old um my family, I, I got into a, a bad incident, incident uh, got a assault and battery on a police officer, and uh, uh, I think I got a couple of protective orders mm-hmm. put on me, and, and I had to go to my first treatment. And it was a 13-month uh, called Teen Challenge. Mm, oh, yeah, I've heard of it. I have family <laughs> that went through it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I made it about two weeks, mm-hmm. and I snuck out in the middle of the night. And uh, and that's just really, you know, I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was forced on me. And, you know, I remember I came back and, and I was like, okay, you know, in that two weeks, I learned everything I need to learn and, and nobody needs to be afraid. And, and it, I think I made it maybe a month. Mm-hmm. And, and that was really just kind of, th- that was my MO. I mean, I was, I was in it and it got to the point where I was selling it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just to help for my addiction. And, um, you know, I, I found myself running up and down I 40 with, um, uh, meth and mm-hmm. weed and 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 that became my identity uh mm-hmm. it, it, and it's funny there's this movie uh you ever seen the movie blow with johnny, uh, with johnny yeah Depp? yeah yeah so there's this there's this scene where he's going through the airport and he's got it going on you know all this yeah. money and these suitcases full of money and cocaine mm-hmm. and that black betty song is playing and mm-hmm. and i was like man you know that's 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 cool you know yeah. that's that's what i want to be and i hit you know, paused right there. And it's like, it's like I based my life. I was like, all right, that looks fun. We're going to go do that. And and I did it for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And then I think the uh, second time I got put in jail, the movie they were showing on the Friday night at, at the jail uh, mm-hmm. was the movie Blow. Mm-hmm. And I watched it all the way through. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't realize that he lost everything. Yeah. He lost his wife. He lost his kid. Uh, he, he lost it all. Mm. And I remember just sitting there thinking, holy crap, you know, what did I just do? I, and, 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 you know, I'd been to treatment a couple of times by then, and they, they always say, play the tape all the way through before you make that decision. Mm-hmm. Well, that was the ultimate. Why didn't I, why didn't I play the tape all the way through? Um, but it just, you know, it just, it got worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, I went in and out of treatment, in and out of treatment. I'd, mm. I'd get in trouble or, or try to fade the heat by, by going to treatment and, and just nothing really ever sticked, mm. uh, or stuck. And I, I met my wife in, uh, oh, I guess it would have been 2007 and it, we were dating and, and she had, I mean, she was four years younger than me and had never, you know, really done anything, maybe drank a few times, never mm. drank in high school or anything. 
And, you know, within a year of dating me, uh, I've got her using meth and, mm-hmm. and it just was a disaster. I mean, and, and it wasn't anything I intended to do. It's just, it, it, it was just the disease and, and everything that came about me. I mean, hurt people, hurt people. And I just kept hurting people. Mm-hmm. And, and finally, uh, you know, I got a little bit of sobriety, uh, under my belt in 2009 to 2013. And it wasn't, it was, I was just sober. There was no recovery. Mm-hmm. It was just, I didn't want to go to prison. So I got sober and, yeah. and, uh, I, uh, we started having kids. We got married in 2010 and started having kids. And, um, it just, you know, I was, I was, uh, uh, working out here, uh, for my dad mm-hmm. and I got back into the drinking a little bit yeah. and, you know, I drank successfully for a year. When I say successfully, I, you know, I didn't get a DUI. Yeah. I uh, didn't use any meth and smoke any weed. Um, still showed up to work late and, you know, it, it was unsuccessful, but I thought it was su- successful until one night where I got back on the, the meth. I got drunk enough and it's like, all right, the alcohol is not doing it for me. Yeah. And, uh, it was like, I mean, uh, it's like I had, it's like my second coming. Like, okay, mm-hmm. I remember what this was like. This is awesome. And the only difference between this t- that time and the times before was I have a wife and I have kids at home. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I remember I went straight to my wife and I was like, hey, look, here's what I did. Here's the bag. Throw it away. And that was something I never did was tell the truth. Yeah. You know, I had to I kept I was a guy that kept going until I get caught. Yeah. And even when I got caught, it's like, oh, no, that was somebody else's. Or, you know, what I mean, it mm-hmm. just just didn't know how to tell the truth. And I just, I was like, all right, I'm going to try this because I'm afraid of what this opening this door is going to do. And she's like, okay, you know, I'm glad, glad I told you. But one thing I didn't realize is, you know, it takes more than just that. You know, mm-hmm. you got to put action behind it. And yeah. I didn't put any action behind it. I think I probably stayed sober a couple of weeks and I woke up one morning and, and that was the first thing that was on my mind. And I mean, it was, I was off to the races for a full mm-hmm. year. Uh, my wife left. She moved in with her mom. Uh, I quit my job. I mean, it just was back to, uh, 30 years old, back to running the streets, mm-hmm. selling dope again. Yeah. And, uh, my family in 2015, uh, my wife and my parents, they came together and, and had a third party affidavit signed, uh, because I'd mentioned that, you know, uh, I wanted to, end it i wanted to die Mm -hmm. and so they had a third party affidavit signed that that i was gonna harm myself and uh clinton i was in clinton because i was in the casinos a lot Mm -hmm. and i just stay in a hotel and go to the casino and and the cops bang on my door about 9 a.m uh january 30th 2015 and they take me in on a welfare check Mm -hmm. and i spent seven days in a psych ward and during that time they had found um found a little bit of meth and you know it's one of those deals where the da's like you know hey if you go to treatment uh you know we're not going to file charges Mm -hmm. and and my you know i think my dad had a lot to do with help help with that you know we just want to get him some help and you know i'm i'm like no you know i never would have gotten trouble if my parents and my wife wouldn't have told on Mm -hmm. me and you know i was upset uh but here i didn't want to go to prison either so I, I go to, I find myself after seven days in, in, uh, the, uh, padded room, uh, going to Rob's ranch. Mm-hmm. And, and I spent two weeks there just angry. Uh, my mindset was, you know, I'm going to do my 90 days, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm going to get out and I'm going to go right back to it. Um, because something had shifted in me. I, I had, I became hopeless. I mean, yeah. after having a few years of n- not using any substances, having a family, and then going right back to it and it falling off as fast as it did, it's like, you know what? There's, I'm never going to be able to do this. Yeah. And, and I was angry at my parents. I, I, I wouldn't let them call me. I wouldn't call them, my wife too. And I'm sitting there in group one day, and, and they have kind of a, a circle chair setting there at Rob's Ranch. And, and there's this kid. He's probably 24 years old. And... And he's fixing to get out, and he's a meth addict. He's been there for 90 days. Well, yeah. They ask him, they say, Sean, what are you going to do? You know, what's the first thing you're going to do tomorrow when you get out? Uh, what's your plan? And he said, man, I'm going to smoke the fattest blunt I've ever smoked. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm sitting there, and I'm like, dude, you know, this is my ninth treatment center. Yeah. And I, I, I start arguing with him. I'm like, hey, man, 
I know you think weed's not your problem, but right. it's going to lead you right back to the meth. And I argued with him for 45 minutes. Yeah. And I kept telling him, that, you know, it's not going to work the way you think it is. And and finally, one of the therapists looked at me and said, are you angry? And I was like, yeah, man, I I give up, man. He's, he's just going to die. And mm-hmm. he said, "You're so you're upset with him? And I said, yeah, he just don't see it. And he said, well, now you know how your family feels dealing with you. Yeah. And that was the moment. I just remember I just started bawling. Yeah. Uh, that was the first moment that that layer, first layer of denial mm-hmm. uh, was stripped away. And and I was finally able to see a little bit of what my family had been dealing with yeah. and how I couldn't see what was going on around me. And And it was that day that I decided, you know what? I'm going to take these last uh, 76 days, and I am going to just surrender. Mm. Uh, I'm going to do what I don't want to do. Uh, I'm not going to BS people in the, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. And mm. we went to that meeting that night. Uh, outside meeting came kind of like what you guys do over there with us. Mm. And, I, and I just said, hey, guys, I got something to say. You know, I'm a liar. Uh, I'm a junkie. I'm mm-hmm. an alcoholic. I, I don't know how to tell. The, and I exposed everything to them, you know, because I said, if I don't do this, you give me long enough, I am going to put on the show and be who I think I need to be in front of all y'all. So yeah. I'm just going to get all this out right now. I'm a terrible father, terrible husband. Mm-hmm. And, and it was like... <laughs> Okay, so now I can, I've got it all out on the table. So, God, I'm going to give it all to you and let's just restructure me the way that you see me. Yeah. And, and it just, that's, I, it's like I had to surrender daily. And, you know, I, I wanted to tell Fibs because that's all I had ever done, you know, because mm-hmm. I thought I needed to fit in and this and that. And, and I just started being honest and, and, and talking to God and, and all the other treatment centers. I needed to be the center of attention and go where everybody else was. And right. in my free time at Rob's Ranch, I went and, I went and read the Bible and studied and I went and read my big book and studied and, and I journaled and, and, and just prayed and mm-hmm. and just did something different for the first time and and it just really started you know I started feeling that connection uh with the lord mm-hmm. and and while I was there you know it, it, i'm I'm praying one day and uh and there's a guy my roommate he's like man you know if if you started some kind of ministry, there's a lot of guys in here that would they'd probably go work with you or whatever mm-hmm. and and I'm like, oh yeah no i'm 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 gonna go back and work for my dad but Thanks. I appreciate it. that. Was nice of you. Yeah. And then it was like more and more. I kept just getting signs of, "Hey, you know, have you ever thought about opening sober living homes?" And mm-hmm. and I'm like, "No, I haven't." You know. And and it's like that's pretty much was 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 when the door started opening for Pat the Miracles. Mm-hmm. And and my wife called me and she's like, "Hey, uh, my her her dad who was uh, an addict." He had overdosed for like the eighth time and mm-hmm. she called and she was upset and she said he's in the hospital and I don't know if he's going to make it. Wish we could find him a place like where you're at. And, mm-hmm. and I remember going to the, the, the people in the office and I was like, Hey, can we get my father in law in? And they're like, you know, it caught, co- it costs money. And they're like, yeah, you know, it'd be 13,000. We don't have any scholarships available right now. And I'm, I'm like, well, I don't have 13,000. He doesn't mm-hmm. have 13,000. Uh, my family paid for me to come yeah. and they're like, man, we're, you know, we're sorry. We don't have any scholarships right now. And, and I walked away from that and I was a little bit angry and mm-hmm. I just went to God and I was like, you know, what, what can I do, God, to help him? Mm-hmm. And that's whenever, you know, God put it on my heart that's like, okay, not everybody's going to have the money to afford this treatment. And this is the best treatment I've ever had in my life. And I've mm-hmm. been to all of them. And, and so I was like, all right, you know, let's start something where we can raise money for the guys who can't afford it, for yeah. the guys who are in the ditches, uh, who have no way out. And that's where Path to Miracles was was really started. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started with uh, we opened a sober living home. Uh, I was actually client number one, and there was uh, four guys that were in treatment with me. They were the first guys to move in, mm-hmm. and uh, which I wouldn't suggest that for just anybody. I mean, mm-hmm. we was just God. God was all over it uh, for it to work. And then we started raising money for guys who couldn't afford it. We had mm-hmm. our first golf tournament, I think, when I was six months sober. Yeah. And the uh, we, we just started paying for guys to go to treatment out here in western Oklahoma. Yeah. And, and a lot of it was old buddies. Uh, you know, the two guys that I sold the most 
meth two were the first two guys I put in treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, you know, the 14th guy we put in was my Mm father-in-law. He finally got to the point where, you know, okay, he wants some help and we, we paid for his treatment and, and he came and stayed with us, uh, end of the summer. He's got uh, almost seven years sober now. Um, so that's kind of how the, the path to miracles came about. And we just kept, you know, and, and, and it's like our biggest deal was we don't want, a, a bank account that has a, a big amount in it. That's mm-hmm. not what we're looking for because yeah. we're going to use what we have when God tells us to. Mm-hmm. And and we've done that for nine years now, and he's never not gave us enough to help somebody. I mean, there's times where we got down to $1,000 in the bank, mm-hmm. and it's like, well, hey, it's going to cost 3000 to get this guy in. Well, we went and put together a quick fundraiser mm-hmm. uh, concert and got some of the local churches and, and raised enough money for that guy to go. And it's just, God has just, he's just been blessed it after mm-hmm. blessing after blessing. And, and we just, like I said, our nonprofit is, it's different. Like if it's there and we're told to use it, we just go use it yeah. and, and we're not going to try to stack it and we're never going to have a bunch of money in there. And that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but we, we've used it wisely. I think we've helped, I mean, at least 110 guys go through treatment in the last nine years. Mm, wow. Um, and then it got to a point where there were some businessmen that, that owned that property that we have now in Sayre. Mm-hmm. And they came to me one day and they said, well, you know, we see what you're doing in Western Oklahoma. What could you do with this building? And I'm like, man, you know, we could open a treatment center. Mm-hmm. And so I went to Rob's ranch and cause that's where we had sent all the guys and, and they were sending guys to our sober living homes. They were our biggest partner. <clears throat> and, um, they were like, man, it, we had just had a meeting this morning about possibilities of opening a 30 day treatment center. Mm-hmm. And it was all, it was just, it was, God was all over it. Yeah. Um, I was, I worked with my dad part time and I went in there and I quit and mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to take over this building. And it took me a year to remodel. I, I mean, it was bad yeah. when we took over. Yeah, I bet. And, uh, you know, we opened up right in the middle of, of COVID, mm-hmm. uh, May 2020, uh, opened up with five clients. And, and it's just grown in the mm-hmm. last four years. I mean, God has just the things that he's been able to do <clears throat> with our staff, uh, with the guys who come to us. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's been miracle after miracle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's my wife will tell you, you know, what's the difference between the other times and between now. And she'll tell you it's the minute he decided he was going to start helping others. Yeah. And, and that has been the biggest thing for me yeah. it, it's every time i went to treatment before i get out and okay i'm going to get back what what i need or mm-hmm. i'm going to get a big nice truck or money in the bank and and when i got out of treatment this time it was like you know let's just see who we can serve mm-hmm. and and not serving you know myself and of course we all get selfish i'm i'm not saying i'm not a selfish person mm-hmm. i have a ton of selfish tendencies um but one of the 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 best things that that god has been able to teach me is 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 how to be a servant mm-hmm. and and that's good for a guy like me um uh, because i it was just take 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 yeah. and and you know i i i get asked to come speak a lot but it's it's has absolutely nothing to do with me. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's all God. God transformed my life. He he led me to Rob's ranch. He he gave me. He allowed me to to have that humiliating situation mm-hmm. uh, in the psych ward. And uh, you know, I, when I finally gave it all to him, I mean, a guy who couldn't stay sober for five minutes uh, has put together. You know, January thirty first will be nine years, mm-hmm. and and he's just. I don't know. He runs my life a lot better yeah. than I ever did. Yeah. And and today I get to coach, you know, I coach it, 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 all year long. I coach basketball, mm-hmm. youth basketball, youth softball. Um, I mean, if after work, generally you're going to find me on a ball court or a ball field until mm-hmm. about nine or 10 at night. And, and that's another way that <clears throat> my ministry, you know, and that's what one of the things that God showed me early on. It's like, your ministry, yeah, it's going to be with guys like you who struggle with drug addiction, mm-hmm. but it doesn't stop when you're talking with a drug addict. Yeah. Your ministry is when you're talking to a kid, when you're talking to your team. Uh, so, you know, 
the first thing we do uh, before we hit practice is pray. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a, a, a scripture that we say, Hebrews twelve eleven. no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Mm-hmm. It is painful, but afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Mm-hmm. We say that before we take the field. We say the prayer and that before we leave. And and that's that's been one of my, you know, smiling, you know, the things that I can just really yeah. smile about. Because I know what we're able to do with drug addicts and alcoholics, but it's with our youth. Um, because at any given moment, any of those 25 to 30 kids I coached that year, you know, that's one of my fears sometimes is like, you know, one of these kids may end up being like me. Yeah. Uh, I want them to know Jesus. I yeah. want them to know you know, that, that we pray before we do things and, and we go to the Lord, even if we, we just got our butts whooped uh, on the basketball court of the field, yeah. we're still going to give him praise. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not always going to go our way, but God is always going to be good. Yeah. And, and we're always going to give him the glory. So, um, it's just that the transformation that God's been able to do, uh, not only through me, but through my family and, and the kids that I work with and the addicts, it's just been, I'm just blessed that I get to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, I, it's funny because as you're talking about Rob's ranch, you know, I didn't realize that that resource was here in Western Oklahoma. And I think a lot of people don't, you know, and it, I think it goes back to, <clears throat> I think, I always say you're like in two different categories when it comes to any of this, like even suicide, you know, like suicidal tendencies or alcohol or drugs. It's like if it hadn't affected, you know, there's some people that's like, I never thought about killing myself ever. I never had a problem with alcohol. And, you know, they don't have those problems. But and so it never enters their mind until I'm like maybe their kid struggles with it or maybe their brother or somebody close in their family struggles. With it, and that's when it becomes real, yeah. you know, and they may not know that that resource is here. I had no clue that resource was here until I went through it myself, went through, you know, this, this struggle myself. And then through, you know, through different meetings and stuff, realized, man, this resource is here. Yeah. And, 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 and like I said at the beginning, was very impressed. Like, I've, I've been super impressed by the guys there. You know, it's like these guys are good guys. You know, yeah. they're nice guys, you know. And I mean, in 30 days or whatever, you're not going to put that into somebody. You know what I'm saying? They're, it's like, I think they're genuinely good guys. Oh, yeah. Who just like me has struggled with something. You know, they're struggling and they're trying to figure it out. And, and like you said, they may have been forced to do it or they, you know, they surrender to it immediately. But either way, I think people will be surprised by just how genuinely good guys they are. When I'm listening to your story, <clears throat> also it reminds me, like almost <clears throat> every story, whether you're talking about reading, you know, in the back of like the big book, you hear, yeah, there's all kinds of stories back there and they update it, you know, frequently and like newer, you know, kind of versions of the story. And then I'm listening to your story. Do you know that there's a direct correlation is, and that I can relate to? Like there's parts of your story I can't relate to. I've never done math or whatever, but the part that I can relate to is something was basically missing. Like I didn't feel like I fed in, didn't feel like I, you know, it's almost in every single story, whether you're literally listening to somebody right in front of you or you're reading about it, it starts out the same, which is something was wrong with me. And then I did whatever your drug of choice is or alcohol. And all of a sudden I felt like I fed in. Yep. And then that works for a while mm-hmm. until it doesn't work yeah. anymore. Does it make sense? No, it makes and I'm listening to your story and you're like, you know, I think it's so easy. You know, Emily and I were talking about this. I think it's so easy to like downplay something simple as moving from Clinton to Elk city. Yeah. Or you know what I mean? Yeah. To downplay that as in, you know, um, oh, come on. People deal with bigger stuff than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so easy. to. But the bottom line is, is that it may be that or maybe something bigger. It yeah. doesn't matter like how big it is. It really affects you, period. And, you know, for like for me to like I, I, I played that card kind of for a long time where I was like, man, people deal with a lot worse stuff than I dealt with. I, I don't know why I'm hung up on this, you know, but I kept coming back to certain things. Mm-hmm. And the bottom line is, is like what we're saying is I felt like I did not fit in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And alcohol helped me feel like I fit in. Hmm. And that worked oh, yeah. for a while. You know, I didn't go through like 
start drinking and every day I drank and every day it was causing me problems. Now there was a long period of time where it was fine. It worked, mm-hmm. you know, until, until at some point it didn't, you know, I went through like six months or a year of not drinking and then I would drink and then I would have, have problems or I wouldn't have problems. But it's like what I started to develop over time was, is that every time, whether it be something tragic or something sad or something happy, that's where I turned. Yeah. You know what I mean? I turned to those things. Yeah. Until like in my situation, and and like you said, it but now you're looking back, it's like the grace of God working in my life because like I'd had one tragic situation after another at towards the end. And I mean it could be just partly self-pity, but it could also be partly those are exactly what God needed to, uh, you know, those things were put in my life are allowed to happen. So I could seek him. So I could seek a better way. Because when I look back at it, it was like one tragic after it wasn't a whole life of that. But it was like, whenever I was young, maybe it was not, you know, this whole idea of not fitting in. And then so I turned to alcohol and it gave me what I needed. I made friends. I mean, I felt like I fit in. And then later down the road, years later, you know, this tragedy, what are you going to do? I'm drinking. This tragedy, whatever, this thing happened. I'm drinking. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, it was like I, 18 years of divorce that was, you know, I was turned to drinking. You know, I had 18 years of marriage and I get divorced. Well, I turned to drinking. Then I had this happen. I turned to drinking, you know. Um, and then it, it's like with anybody, I always say, it's like, man, it's not a problem until it is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there could be people that could literally, drink or do whatever, smoke weed or whatever, and it not become a problem yeah. until it is a problem. Yeah. But those stories, I'm just amazed because they all begin the same. And and that's where you and I can relate yeah. because our story is the same in that aspect is that, man, I felt like I struggled to fit in. This helped me fit in, I, you know. And so as I'm listening to that, I'm like, wow. You know, there's some people who would say that know you because – um, I say this laughingly, kind of a little jokingly, a little bit. But you know, your family's well known here, you know, in this area because of your dad and the dealership and all that stuff. But some people say, "Well, yeah, that's easy for Jeremy because he came." You know, some people say silver spoon in his mouth kind of thing, and I, I don't believe that because I'm listening to your story and that, I mean, that was taken away at you kind of destroyed it or you messed it up. Does that mean, you know? Um, but I think like I'm hearing your story and I'm like, meaning that, uh, about starting the, the, the sober living and starting, uh, pathways to miracle here in, in, in Western Oklahoma. And I think that somebody could listen to that and say, well, you know, it, it you know, God works like that and his, or it's not God. It's basically, you know, that, oh, yeah. that history or that, you know, family or whatever, um, you know, and I know that's not true. What's your thoughts on that? And, and, and that's totally fine. I mean, and that was honestly, that was one of the things I, I struggled with for the longest, yeah. uh, having my own identity, um, mm-hmm. because no matter if I went and met somebody for the first time, it was, yeah. oh yeah, hey, you know him, that's Doug Gray's son. Yeah. And, yeah. and I struggled with that. It's like, well, you know, but. I, I, I used that a mm-hmm. lot too growing up. Um, so whenever I was able to expose myself and find my true identity in the Lord, mm-hmm. and one of the things I had to do was, you know, I always put my dad up here on this pedestal. Yeah. And and they asked me in Rob's Ranch that they asked me if I was going to be able to take him off that pedestal and pull him down a notch and put God where he was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And when I did that and, and God gave me my true identity, it really didn't matter what people thought or mm-hmm. what they said. And, 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 and it really, I spent my whole life up until I got sober worrying about, oh, what are they thinking? What are mm-hmm. they going to say? Or or are they saying this? Or are they saying that? Whenever I found my relationship with God and, and got all that stuff that's on the inside that I was hiding, when I exposed it and got it out, I was finally okay with me, mm-hmm. and it didn't matter what anybody said. Yeah. And, and I know that, you know— uh, my father has blessed me, mm-hmm. my heavenly father. Yeah. Uh, he's the one that's blessed me and helped me so much mm-hmm. in the last year, nine years. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad is one of my very best friends in this entire world. Mm-hmm. Another miracle because for the longest time he was, you know, the, the, the disease, uh, taught, 
told me that he was my biggest enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if anybody says that, it really you know it doesn't bother mm-hmm. me. They they don't they don't they don't know the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's okay. I mean, the the one thing about me today is I'm an open book. If anybody mm-hmm. anybody wants to ask, hey, did your did your dad buy that treatment center or do mm-hmm. that or mm-hmm. it's you know the answer is yeah. no. But he has been there to support me, and that's been one of the biggest blessings to have my dad yeah. uh, throughout all this. Well, I. Uh, you know, I, it, it proves kind of like what we're talking about, the profound impact that has been made because I didn't, you know, this is the first time to meet you. Yeah. And I had heard about not that you're Doug Gray's son, but that you about Pathways to Miracle. That's yeah. what I had heard yeah. about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had heard about what a great guy you were. You know, I, I know people that you know and they're like constantly telling me, but when they're telling me, they're not telling me about, you know, a new car, they're talking yeah. about what you've done over there. Yeah, that's great. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So I, I can completely relate to that yeah. because I'm like, you know, I've heard that. That's the part that I've heard, yeah. you know, and some people that I really care about yeah. that are like Jeremy Gray. I didn't honestly think that I, you know, that I could get you to here to, to do this. So yeah. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I um kind of on the, you know, well, let me say that I struggled whenever I first quit drinking. I struggled with, you know, God was always there in my life. You know what I mean? He, he, he I don't know. And I was telling Emily, it's like, it was always kind of been a blessing, man. Cause I look back and God's always been there. You know, I've always wanted this relationship with God. Um, so I got sober. I, I realized that I was really, um, <clears throat> struggling with, I was very discouraged with God, very disappointed with God. And part of it kind of the, the, what the the line that was going through my head was, you know, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian, and yet God, you won't help me. You know, I can't get better, I can't do better. You know, I'm, in other words, I was so disappointed in myself because I'm a Christian acting like this. Yeah. My behavior didn't match what I believed. You know, I didn't. You know, it's this has been a huge revelation for me is understanding. Like, it's kind of like what you talk about action. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really understood what that meant. You know, because I didn't understand. It's like really strongly believed in God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. I believed in all those things. But also I looked at more like universal, like, yeah, of course, God forgives everybody, loves everybody. But I didn't really believe he'd do it for me. I'll, I'll never forget like me, the like God put this on my heart one day when I was sitting in a, a meeting with a group of alcoholics. And I was like, man, I strongly believe that God will help every one of these guys. They have and they will, but I, it was kind of like a huge realization that I hadn't believed that he would do it for me. Yeah. Like that he, like he would either ignore me or just wasn't listening or didn't care. I, I, you know, so those became like my spiritual growth in the beginning. I'm like, why am I so discouraged with him? And, and I realized it's because man, he's been in my life, but yet he didn't seem to help me. Uh, he's been in my life, but I'm still acting like I'm still, you know, I, I was a not a good husband, you know, struggled in these. It just seemed like I was always struggling, you know, and I'm like, well, God, if God's there, why isn't he helping me? Why? Isn't, and those became like, I think the, the foundation for like getting help is realizing, OK, this is my view of God, even though I thought that I had a great view of God. You know, because there's a lot of crazy religious stuff out there, right? And I really honestly had a pretty good foundation. But the problem is, is that I didn't think he wanted to do it for me, you know? Oh, yeah. But I'm looking at guys that are struggling and, I, and and how he's helped them. And I know God cares about them. You know, God is doing things in their life. But I just didn't believe pers- in that personalized kind of thing that he's wanting, he's doing it for me. And as I'm listening to your story, it's like, man, I'm curious what you were like, Kind of how your vision of God, your version of God or vision of God changed from like in your addiction to like the sober part and like how that developed. Well, I'll tell you, I had a real big eye opener as soon as I got out of treatment. Uh, So I'd been gone for 90 days and they told me, you know, I I had to go back while I was working on opening the sober living homes, had to come back and work part time selling cars. And I said, I asked my counselor, I said, so what do I do? If somebody asked me where I've been the last 90 days, one of my customers, mm-hmm. you tell them the truth. And I said, well, that, I mean, 
that could hurt, you know, the business. That could hurt the car deal. Or mm-hmm. and he said, I don't care. Do the complete opposite of what you want to do. And you're going to want to lie. You have to t- start telling the truth. Yeah. So it's like, all right, Lord. And I remember praying hard that first day. Yeah. And I'm and I'm out there and I'm showing these trucks to this. He's probably 75 years old yeah. man. <clears throat> and uh, he says, can you check the rebates on this? And, of course, my first day back. And I said, well, I've, I've been gone. Let me go check rebates. And I come back out and. He said, I gave him the rebates and he said, so where have you been gone to? And I, everything in me wanted to say uh, a lie. And yeah. I just said, God, just help me tell the <laughs> truth. And, and I told him the truth. I said, well, I had to go get some help. I went to a 90 day Christ based, uh, drug and alcohol rehab. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the look on his face. It was like, yeah, I'm not buying from you. Right. And he just didn't say another word, got in his truck and he left. And I remember walking back to the front door and I was thinking, okay, this is not going to work. They're, they're wrong. God, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, manipulate the situation somehow. Mm-hmm. God, just help me, help me. And uh, it was a couple hours later and these two guys showed up and they said, uh, Hey, we want to look at some trucks. And, and I just started thinking, please don't ask me the rebates. Right, right. <laughs> well, they did. And I just, you know, I, I, I went back in and, and I said, all right, I, sorry guys, I've been gone. Uh, and, and they asked, where you been? And I mean, I just said, all right, God, I'm trusting you. Yeah. And I told them the same thing. Just got back from Christian based rehab. Yeah. And I spent two hours talking with one of the guys about his brother, uh, who's struggling with alcohol yeah. and trying to help him. Mm. And they ended up buying five trucks. They were starting a new oil field company. Wow. And it's like, that was whenever God gave me the, you know, it's like, okay, uh, the enemy put something in front of you to where yeah. it was easy for you to just lie and, and yeah. walk away from me, but you trusted me and you did what you were supposed to do and, and, you know, look at the blessing on the other mm-hmm. side. So that kind of set forth everything for the rest of my, my recovery. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I know he gave me a big bone right there at the beginning. Uh, but I could have, it, it all could have shifted. You know, we couldn't be sitting here. If I'd have lied to that first guy, mm. we, none of this probably would have happened. I mean, yeah. because I would have been right back in those old steps. But I, you know, I just trusted in God. I trust, had faith in my therapist, what he mm-hmm. was telling me, you know, you got to tell the truth. And, uh, you know, it just, it, my relationship has grown and mm-hmm. grown and grown. And, and I, w- they described it to me one time. They, they said, you know, what's God's will for your life? And this is when I was in treatment. Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't, I don't know, you know. And they said, well, go pray about it, think about it. And I couldn't come up with the answer. And finally, uh, one of my therapists has said, God's will for your life is the complete opposite of what you want for it. Yeah. Wow. And it made, you know, it's like, okay, so everything that I want, mm-hmm. God wants the opposite. So that's when I was able to start differentiating my, my wants and my needs and, and where God needs to use me and, and not asking for what I want and, and just going where he wanted me to go. And, yeah. and throughout that, I mean, like I said, he's he continued to bless me, continued to bless me. My, my faith has just grown stronger and stronger mm-hmm. and stronger. And my idea of God was confused. I was confused my whole life. It was more like a genie in the bottle. Let's rub the lamp, make my wish. I want this. Mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. that. And he never gave it to me. So therefore, I was always mad at him. Yeah. And once I realized that it had nothing to do with what he could give for me and what I was, what I needed to do to serve him and help others, you know, it was a, it was a tire, entirely mm-hmm. new ball game. And and like I said, it's just been blessing after blessing. And yeah. and there's been a lot of tough stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's life is not easy. I mean, deaths and I mean, just in the recovery community, I bet you I've lost 15 guys that I've worked with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ODs, uh, wrecks. I mean, it's just, it's been, it's been tough stuff where I've been like, okay, I'm not cut out for this. Uh, God, you know, mm-hmm. let's, let's go do something else. And then God's just like, nope, we got to keep going, keep going, keep yeah. going. And, and it's just, you know, it, we're going to have stuff happen to us and, and we're going to want to tuck our tail and we're going to want to run and hide. I am anyways, because that's how I was for so long. Mm-hmm. But as long as I am honest about my feelings, about what's going on inside to somebody, I've got a pretty good shot of, of 
staying in that peace, staying in that happiness and getting through it. It's the minute that I quit trusting God and say, all right, I'm not telling anybody about this. I'm going to keep this to me. I'm hurting. I want to cry, but I got to act tough. I got to act like I'm okay. That's when I start going backwards. Yeah. I've got to be an open book. I've got to be transparent. Got to I got to show up here with you and tell the truth yeah. in order for to stay in line with him and continue to be a blessing and 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 be blessed and and stay in his will. That's yeah. a long I, way of answering your no, question. No, no, but you know what's funny is I'm like I uh I, I like man, I can't tell you how much, you know, I can I just you know, I love hearing your words and what you're saying. And <clears throat> I can't even imagine like for me, you know, I put my story out there through the podcast and through some social media, you know, um, nowhere near kind of my story hasn't gone out there nowhere near like probably yours has over those nine years because of time and whatever else. And I'm just amazed by the number of people who constantly have reached out to me. And I'm like, man, people are hurting. People are. And, and I, and I think that's God's way of showing me also that it's like you mentioned it earlier. It's like, man, Serving other people and helping other people, that's a big part of this deal. Yeah. And I, I, I don't like I've worked in, uh, an industry where I help people. You know, I told you I was in the nursing home industry. So my whole life I've been helping old people and I've been doing that my whole life. And so, you know, there's some people like that, you know, that's kind of, a, it's been a gift for me because some people don't understand that. They may be working the oil field or an industry where they're not really helping people, but I worked in that industry, but it's so easy to get that confused because, man, this deal is about helping other people yeah. and it is about serving other people. And that can look like a whole host of things, you yeah. know what I mean? But I, I'm shocked by the number of people who, in my short time, have reached out and like struggling and, and, yeah. and I, and I'm and and two things. It reminds me that that's where it's at is helping other people, serving other people, but also that people are hurting and there's a lot of hurt out there. Yeah. And you know, and I I also it's a good reminder to me that um, it's almost like, especially in the early stages of of sobriety, that you are learning to live differently. So you might have these little annoyances or these little things happen in your life. But uh, those things, I believe, are helping me build to when something does happen that's bigger, like somebody dying or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you can't deal with the little things, you know, then you're sure going to struggle with the big things. And and I think, you know, God allows those little things sometimes, those annoyances, those like, you know, whatever struggles that you have on more on a daily basis – um, for to teach me, you know, to, to really help me to think differently, do things differently. Um, and I, di I would have never thought this, but I, I've come to that realization that I had to think differently and do things differently, yeah. you know, because, you know, I might have, I keep talking about this, but I might have had like, 10 different problems going on. It sounded like you did too. You know, you have a problem with the law, you have a problem with this, you have a problem with that. <clears throat> and at the time you think that, well, if I can maybe get this problem, legal problem handled, then everything will be better. Or I can handle my relationship problem and then everything. But, um, and I was doing that kind of like juggling these things. If I can fix this one over here, then this will be, I was even doing counseling and I like, you know, deal, trying to deal with all these things. But what I didn't realize is I had to quit drinking first. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The drinking, even though it necessarily didn't cause it all, <laughs> but it definitely, like, my, I mean, if, if it didn't cause it, it had an indirect, right? Because it's just the way my mind was thinking. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I didn't realize how much I just cared about when I'm going to drink again, mm -hmm. you know, like my, focused on that. I, I It's funny because, like, not long after I got sober, I, uh, my wife and I went out of town for some training and, uh, she, you know, she, she didn't have a drinking problem, you know, so she, you know, drank every once in a while and whatever. So we're going to hang out with people from this, uh, this, you know, this training we're doing. And she just slyly mentions to me that, so, Hey, you know, I'd like to have a drink tonight, you know, and again, her drink and my drinking was completely yeah. different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here my mind starts taking over. Well, it's eight. 815, you know, the liquor store closed at nine. And I literally start worrying about when we're going to go get that for her, 
When she didn't care about it. I cared about it. So literally that night I'm like, okay, it's eight 45. And so I go run to the liquor store and I go in there and I get her some liquor. And then I you get back and we hang out with these people. I didn't drink, yeah. but I'm like, after that, that was some huge realization to me. Like, wait a minute. Why am I worried about this? Why am I thinking about her drinking? Like I think about my own, you know? <laughs> and, and I, I, at that moment, I really made up my mind that it's like, I've got to think differently. I got to, uh, in this subject, I've got to let her deal with her, that stuff, me not get involved, yeah. definitely not go to the liquor store to get, you know, her liquor and because she don't have this problem. I do, you know, but I'm thinking about it like in my problem, in my addict addiction, or I'm thinking about the way I would think about it. You yeah. know what I mean? And even though that's a kind of a funny story, but it's like, it was a good reminder to me. It's yeah. like, that's how you used to think yeah, for sure. You know, and here I am doing it for somebody else, yeah. you know? And, uh, but I saw that in so many areas. Cause let's say that my number one coping mechanism was drinking to deal with problems. When I got sober, um, I quickly, my mind went to number two, like, okay, alcohol's number, number one coping mechanism. So now I'm going to go to number two. And then that wasn't good either. Yeah. <laughs> then three, that wasn't good either. And so I start realizing the, the ways that I've been coping with stuff, good and bad my whole life is let's say it's these one, two, and three. Yeah. Two's better than one and three's better than one, better than two and better than one. But one, two, and three aren't good at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you start realizing it, when you really, when God's working in your life, you're like, man, none of these are good. And so I had to like, really, God had to do some work in me because I had to rethink almost everything I was doing yeah. because <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't even know. Like, I struggle with praying. You know, I'm listening to you, you talk about God working in your life, and I struggle praying right from the. I knew praying was important, and <clears throat> you hear about it like it's you know this is based on your spiritual, you know your your, your spirituality, and it's like if that part goes away, then you're going to go right back to the way you were, and it's an important part of this deal, right? Yeah. But I struggle with it. It's even though I, I you know back to what I was telling you, it's like. I had this relationship with God, you know, he was always there. But so I just like mechanically started praying, you know, like I'd get up, I'd go for a walk. That's what I've been doing for a while now. I'd either go f for a walk in the mornings and I would mechanically pray yeah. like God. Um, I pray for my wife. I pray for my son. I pray for my other son, you know, just do it like that. And that started to open up my heart a little bit because I'm like, because I just felt like, it was kind of a, not a waste of time, but almost like he already knows. He already knows what I'm saying, but I just struggled with it, you know? And then like, I couldn't, I didn't like the Lord's prayer to be honest with you. I didn't, I didn't like it. And so a lot of times, you know, I'm going to meetings and they're opening or they're opening with serenity prayer. And I didn't really love that either because I didn't like the mechanicalness of it either. But I'm like, and that started to grow on me. Yeah. It's like, it's a prayer that is, yes, repeated. Yes, it's very, you know, let's basically read and then memorized. And then the same thing with the Lord's Prayer. It starts out, yeah. And so then I'm like, okay. But those things that I used to not like started to become more instrumental in my life. Like the meetings I also went to, like guys were holding hands. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, oh. You know, I had, I realized through this process, I have a little problem with the intimacy, people hugging and holding hands. And, you know, I didn't, I never thought that. I didn't know it until then. And I'm like, but those things started to help a little bit. And I'll never forget somebody, I like I've met, maybe read a devotional or something. And it was talking about like basically naming like 200 or 100 things that you're grateful for. And really it resonated with me. I was like, okay. Because you know, if you start you start naming ten, those are pretty big things you're grateful for, and you get to twenty, okay, they become a little less big things, and then by the time you get to hundred, they're way less because yeah. you're just trying to think of anything. Thank you for I'm able to walk. Thank you for you know, yeah. and I, so one of my walks instead of just naming my family and friends and whatever, then I start just doing that, naming everything I'm thankful for, and of course, as you get down the line, you start to. It becomes smaller, like, thank you that I'm able to get up this morning. Thank you for, you know, and 
I've said it many times. It's like on this walk, because I live out in the country, I would like see deer and I'd see turkey and, you know, things that I didn't really notice before that were right beside my house. Oh, yeah. You know, they're there. I know they're there. And I like, you know, but I'm, wait a minute, this deer is right there. That's cool. <laughs> you know, and they say, well, thank you for that. You know, thank you for that sunrise. And, you know, and it just, and those things, like just started helping me and I struggle with it sometimes still, but yeah. my point is they started helping me to like think differently and okay. just like, okay, what's the spirituality? How am I going to let God work in my life? What am I going to do? You know, and those things helped mechanical as they were, Oh yeah, you know, I get it. And so it's like, and I struggle with church too. You know, I struggle like, uh, just fitting in with church and fitting in. With, I still struggle with that, you know, but it's not, I realize it's not their problem. It's, it was really more my problem because like as soon, if I went to church at like when I was drinking, it's not like I went to church drinking. My point is, is that at, during that time period, as soon as that we said that last prayer and amen, we're done, I out the door, you know, I would not even allow a chance to build relationships or build, you know, f- you know, to build bonds or anything. Does that make sense? Oh, I just out the door, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, it's not like I said, you know, blame them because they wouldn't stop in me and talking to me, but I just felt like, man, I'm struggling with this connection. I'm struggling with this connection. And, you know, and through this process, I've realized how important that connection is, connection, yeah. connection with other people. Yeah. You know, um, and I think as my drinking got worse, you know, like I said, I was isolating myself more. And as we're doing this not for profit, we're realizing, man, it don't matter if you're talking about business. It don't matter if you're talking about physical, like working out. It don't matter if you're talking about spiritual, mental. You've got to find some connections. You've got to have that that the community of some sort, yeah. you know. And for me, that's where like I really found community when I needed it the most, which was through AA, you know, I found it there. Uh, as imperfect as it can be, I found it there, you know, yeah. and then I started saying, I got to build on this. I got to build on a community, you know, some kind of kind of bond or something. And, you know, and uh, so I'm listening to you say, like, you you found your community through Rob's Rants and through, you know, through you know, pathways to miracles and found it. And now you're finding it also through, um, um, what you're dealing with, with like the youth. And it's like, those become, you know, where you're doing both, you're helping people, but you're helping these kids and just being influenced to them. But also you're, you know, that kind of, that's your people, you know? And you also become, if you're going to deal with kids, you're also going to deal with their parents. I mean, it's just, (laughs) that that's the way it is. And, And so I'm listening to it and I'm like, okay, there's some community there. There's some, you know, so anyway, great stuff, man. Yeah. So if people want to really get, reach out to you or to, to, to talk about, maybe they're, you know, like we talked about earlier, they're struggling with help. I mean, struggling with addiction, they're struggling <laughs> and maybe they want to reach out to somebody they know needs help or they need help. What's the best way for them to? You can call our office. Uh, it's 405-455-8704. Um, you can ask for me. Um, if I am not available, anybody who answers the phone uh, will be able to help because they're all part of what we do. So, yeah. But, yeah, you can reach out uh, that way. Uh, you can send an email, uh, jgray at robsranch.org, mm-hmm. um, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, I think that the I, – I think – Another word that has really been uh, meaningful to me is like willingness. You know what I mean? It's like you you do. I've realized through you know our not for profit and through you know groups like AA and all of it is that you have to at some point become willing. It's yeah. like willing to, as we talked about, surrender. Yeah. You know, I think willingness and surrender are kind of a lot oh, yeah. alike <clears throat> because if you're not, you know, if people don't want help. It don't matter what you do. You can open every door in the world for them if they don't want help. And that was me. If I didn't, you know, I had to become willing and surrender kind of at some point. And when I did, then that made all the difference in the world. And and also through that, I realized that has to be an almost everyday thing. And, you know, every moment kind of thing. It's like, am I willing to, like you talked about honesty, am I willing to be honest? Am I willing to, you know, and all those things build, I think, upon each other, I guess. And, yeah. But, 
yeah, if somebody's definitely get in touch with you if they are struggling or trying to figure out what to do next. And I mean, there are resources out there and I think you guys are one of the best. I really do. Well, thank you. I, I, I wanted to have you on here because I knew that just in the, the guys that I've interacted that there, I can tell that things are different than, you know, other resources that I've seen, you know, and I, I think that it, you guys are making a big difference. And so I appreciate what you guys are doing. And well, thank you. And I know it's, uh, I know it's not always easy. And, uh, but I sure appreciate it. And I appreciate you being on the podcast, brother. Yeah, you bet. I and I hopefully, the invite. I hope we, uh, you know, maybe this is a, a, an avenue to become friends and in, in, in other areas too. That'd be great. If I can help in any way, let me know. And I'm, and again, I want to invite everybody listening to our September 16th. Uh, event and it's going to again be in Elk City, Oklahoma Western Oklahoma it's going to be at United Country Exploration Realty which is at 105 South Main in Elk City Uh, you can go to our website even one less to find out more information but we would love to have you guys attend so hope you guys have a great day thanks bye thank you for listening to Positively Undefeated there was something in this show that resonated with you please share the show with your community if you want the show delivered each monday morning to your podcast app of choice please subscribe or follow and if you'd like to get a hold of burl please do so by going to burlstricker.com forward slash contact